Plain Indian Wars. This is a game by GMT which represents the settlement of American settlers in the West in the 19th century at the expense of the native populations. Much like uh, GMT games in the coin lines, this is a game for four factions with four factions that will always be in play, so they will be uh, controlled by different players depending on number of players. And these factions represent uh, an uncomfortable historical conflict, but they do so in a way that shows all voices, shows all perspectives, it shows that for one side to ascend, uh, something terrible had to happen to the other side. Now, uh, this game, again, although the general philosophy, I would say, of representing voices in a complex conflict reminded me of coin games, in truth, mechanically, the game is a lot more similar to games by Academy Games in their uh, Birth of America system. They also have a game with a different topic, 1878 Vikings. And if you look at the board, and if you know that the game is card-driven, it will probably look familiar to you if you played those games. So mechanically, it is more similar to, again, Birth of America, which is a simple card-driven game with custom dice that are differently organized for different factions, and that brings incredible mechanical economy and elegance to the system because simply different factions will roll different dice that have different combinations of things, and just by rolling the dice, your factions will act Historically, their strengths, their weaknesses are simply hardwired into the dice. You don't have to remember a million or little rules, and that's a system that I like very much. When Academy pretty much pioneered it, as far as I can tell, I, haven't, I don't think they released games in the system in a while, so I was happy to also revisit the system here. So we're going to have four factions here, the Northern Tribes and the Southern Tribes, the start on the map at the beginning of the game. Then we have the U.S. Cavalry, which also controls indigenous enemies, basically people that they're manipulating uh, to convince them uh, to uh, put pressure on the flanks of the northern and southern tribes as the uh, cavalry is coming out of St. Louis later on in the game also out of Sacramento protecting the construction of the railroad that will uh, that's something that is very important for that faction and then we have a fourth fa faction which is the settlers that also will come out of St. Louis uh, uh, to a minor extent out of Sacramento and their job is to spread out as much as possible. The settlers also control the wagons that will come out to St. Louis, will move along these paths here, and will score victory points if they manage to exit the board in that way. They are indeed, um, they are indeed people that are traveling and trying to reach California and Oklahoma. Oklahoma? No, I mean the other one, Oregon. What? <laughs> Anyways, so this is the general idea. You're going to have these four factions. And as you can see, um, the, 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 the game, simply by representing uh, the situation, makes a powerful point. There are only native tribes on the board at the beginning of the game. Sure, they don't necessarily like each other all that much. It's not an idealized utopian version. But this is where they are, this is their land, and by the end of the game it won't look like this anymore. The agency of these tribes will be uh, vastly reduced. The railroad may cross the board with, with a very visually imposing line of black cubes. So it shows how history went, and again, but it shows it giving everybody a uh, considerable degree of agency. It's not like one side is just tokens or NPCs, nor is the settlement of the settlers and the work of the cavalry described as a conquest, as a glorious thing, as a destiny. It's just what happened historically and politically. The game, as I said, is card-driven, and each uh, faction has a unique deck. And again, these two factions, Settlers and Cavalry, are allied, so they will uh, want to work together. And these other two factions, Northern and Southern Tribes, are also allied with one another. 
And the way it works is that you're going to have event cards so that are labeled as such and then other cards with names such as migration, engagement or war party. When I teach the game the simplest thing that I call them is event and non-event card cards. You're going to have random activation meaning that each faction has a disc in here. You draw a disc and that side activates and you place it here on this display so you also know who already went and who didn't, like in this case the cavalry goes and then we're gonna, uh, once they are done, we're gonna go with the next and so on and so forth. And again we have two smaller, uh, actually three smaller factions so to speak. One is the railroad uh, which is controlled by the settlers and there are rules uh, ha on how they'll try to build it. For example, to build the branch from St. Louis going westward, you need to have settlers next to where you want to build it. So that makes sense. The more settlers are out there, the more impulse and just sheer labor, I guess, there is there to build the railroad. On the other side, you're going through the Rockies, which is tedious and dangerous and complicated work. So you have to roll dice and that will determine if and how many how many cubes you get to place on this other branch here and once you uh, get out of the Rockies uh, covering all of those spaces that have an M printed on it once that is the case then you can start uh, building normally which is again based on settlers also when the railroad starts being built then you can move <laughs> using the railroad again that of course is only for the US cavalry and for the settlers. The other minor part is the um, native enemies, uh, that is enemies of the southern and northern tribes controlled by the uh, cavalry player, that's why those cubes are there and you simply add a cube there and then you activate an area and then we have the wagons represented by a white disc and again those wagons will start from St. Louis and when that minor party is activated you will uh, place two new uh, cubes, wagon cubes in St. Louis and then you will simply move all of those other ones westward. And so suppose that after a couple of turns, this is the situation. And again, the wagons have to move along these paths. They branch out later, but they are, uh, but but they are fixed. You have to choose where you want to go. And these wagons are well very important because they were this they were they are worth victory points uh, if they make it the other way for the um, for the American players or they're worth points for the indigenous players if they manage to destroy some of those. But destroying them is not that that easy actually. So as for victory indeed uh, there are different ways of scoring victory points for the various factions. The idea is for the American players to settle as much as possible, to control as much of the land as possible, as many areas as possible, to complete the railroad and to get wagons to the other side of the board. And for the uh, indigenous players, the idea is to try to prevent that as much as possible, to retain as much control of the board as possible, and also to kind of like strengthen the borders by taking control of these areas that are under control of enemy, of native enemies. So. <clears throat> We're talking about the cards still, because let's go back to the parties, the, the factions that do use the cards. So when a disc for a faction is drawn, that faction will go. And when they go, the faction must, has to play from their hand of three cards, one and exactly one non-event card. They can also play one or two event cards if they have them. So basically each turn when a party goes they will play at least one card which is a non-event card and optionally one or two events. And they can play them in any order. The events first, then the non-event, event, non-event, event. event. Oopsie. What if you only have three events in your hand, then you choose one of them and you play it with a special rule, you ignore the text entirely, you play it as a non-event. So you always have to play basically a non-event and optionally other events. The so-called non-events uh, have a standard script, so to speak, which is first you get to add cubes 
to the board, the, uh, in this case, for example, uh, of course, different factions that let them in different locations. The cavalry will let them in St. Louis. They can also play some in Sacramento. Then they get to activate groups, and the card also tells you by how much they move. When you move a group, it has to stop when it enters an area containing enemy units. So, for example, they would have to stop there, but suppose that later in the game, this is the situation then with a move that allows each group to move up to two regions. They could have done one, two, and then say I declare that this one is another group and I move it there. Very similar again to Birth of America games. And that's for the non-event cards. When it comes to the events, you, um, you do what they say. There's, for example, explanatory and there is a vast range of things that can happen. What I also appreciate is that there is a lot of history described here. So you really now, uh, you really get to learn a lot about the people that were involved. Again, the human factor, the human element, uh, that this is not about one side going against tokens, <laughs> but it's uh, human beings uh, in, a, in a struggle. I think that's very powerful. So I really learned a lot from these texts here. So when you move, if your move will get your pieces in areas that have enemy pieces, there will be a fight. Now, if there is a single, you enter an area that has a single uh, indigenous piece, then you then they get to roll a single die against you before you do anything. That represents ambush tactics. So, after that, the main fight starts in which if a force has one cube, they roll one die, and if they have more than one cube, they roll two, regardless of how many they have. You only get to roll two dice when you are fighting, so having extra cubes there is still good because those are more hits that you can take, but doesn't generate more extra dice. And when you and then you just uh, players roll the dice. They these symbols represent the hits, which simply reduce. Uh, the force of the opponent by one cube. Um, if you roll a blank after the hits have been assigned, uh, you can use each blank to retreat one of your game pieces. And then, if um, if both sides rolled a a treaty, there you go. If both sides rolled at least a treaty, then actually that means that there was agreement there, and so you ignore any other possible hit, and simply there is no, uh, there is no bloodshedding, but the largest force gets to relocate, to relocate the smaller force wherever they like, well, to an adjacent space where it's legal to, to go. And so there are interesting fact moments in which it looks like one side is looking for peace and the other side uh, is hitting them pretty hard instead. A bit of a prisoner dilemma made with dice here. And of course, again, different uh, uh, dice so will have different combinations. The cavalry has three hits, so that makes them particularly deadly as opposed to the settlers. They have one treaty and they have one hit. Everything else is blank, so they just want to be left alone and they're willing to enable to retreat more. So that's the general uh, idea. That is, once combat is started, it will continue possibly multiple rounds until there are only pieces of one side there through any combination of elimination and or retreats. So, um, this is the general idea. It, the game in, at its core is pretty simple. Again, there are special procedures to handle the combat of the wagon. If the native forces attack them and they fail to hit them, then the wagons, they only want to move, then the wagons will uh, keep moving. They get like a boost to their movement. Again, they're hard to take down. I guess it represents those iconic uh, defensive circles. But the, the, in, at its core, the game is pretty simple. That is, when a faction disc is drawn, the corresponding faction will either get a full activation or will get to perform some minor actions, if it's a minor faction. The man, again, the major faction goes by playing at least a card and up to three resolve the cards which will add new cubes, uh, trigger movement, and then possibly combat, and you continue like this until the end of the game, which will be triggered when a player completely exhausts their deck, or 
if the railroad is built, whichever uh, is whichever happens first, you complete the disc draw, and then you score victory points, which are gonna based on different uh, on different things, based on the different priorities, values, and objectives of the factions. As I'm doing this, of course, I'm, I'm showing the cards. So if you wanna pause, you can get a sense of what they do, and again, what they say. And you may have seen this guy, <laughs> I flashed him uh, briefly, it's a very important card, it represents Custer's, uh, well, lack of planning and just desire to go wherever is the worst possible thing one can find. The Custer card is a special card when the the um, cavalry player sees it, basically whenever it is drawn, no matter when, it is. it must be played immediately. The guy shows up with four cubes in a region with the northern tribe cubes where there are the most, the most. And then immediately attacks and immediately attacks with, uh, with lower strength rolling only one die. So early on in the game, after if he comes out and it's, again, his idea is still completely like rushed and without any planning, but he may get lucky because maybe early on there are only small concentrations. Later on, there may be a massive concentration. Then the guy's like, yep, I think it's a good idea. We're going to go and show them. And he gets destroyed. And then again, there are victory points involved for the, uh, for the uh, indigenous players if they destroy Custer. The turn he shows his arrogant face on the board. In essence, this is how you play Plains Indian Wars. So about a month ago, I was in St. Louis visiting the aquarium with my family. And when you get in there, they show you this beautiful, fun, inspiring mini movie about the railroad, because the aquarium is in the old station. And they depict the railroad as, well, this great achievement, this sight of wonder, curiosity, so many things we can learn thanks to the railroad, etc, etc, etc. And I was there having a good time. I was like, yeah, who doesn't like a choo-choo train? Well, uh... There are people that have reasons to maybe not think of it as fondly uh, as, as some other people do. So, to me, this game is, is important. I know the topic may be controversial, the topic may be uncomfortable, but it does have the advantage of being one of these multi-perspective games that show you the, the objectives, the, the needs, the priorities, of different historical fact factions. Uh, and so yes, the railroad that just a month ago I thought I was like, this is so great, this is so fun. Now I see it as something different, as indeed uh, what the game shows you that the ascent to one side may have a terrible cost for the other. And However, when you approach this topic in games, you have the advantage, again, of giving voice to all factions involved. I think uh, uh, hobby games get a lot of bad rap uh, about colonialism because of the popularity of Euro games, in which in many cases, yes, you only represent the settling side and you ignore the other side, you erase it entirely, you turn it into a passive resource. But in Wargaming, we never had that problem, because in Wargaming, the other side always fight back. The other side is always there uh, to give you heck or to cause you pain. So, historically, Wargames have showed the conflict from the point of view of all sides, showing those sides, again, as, as agents, not as passive uh, as passive. Um, uh, I know, entities. And recently I read the 1619 Project book, uh, which makes the case of how important it is to talk about history of oppression and imperialism without dehumanizing the so-called victims. Uh, and so, for example, the idea of uh, talking about enslaved persons instead of slaves. And again, here we have a game that doesn't just glorify Manifest Destiny, but it shows human beings on both sides of this uncomfortable uh, subject, and I think it's it's a powerful it's a powerful idea uh, that again it shows history in the making from the perspective of the people that were there, and no one is deprived of agency or humanity. It's uh, I think it's uh, an important approach. And personally, one of the reasons why I play games with this kind of approach, sure, I could play a game mechanic exactly like this one with elves and gnomes that are trying to look for points of energy and they're building a ley line of mana. The game would be exactly the same. It would be good. 
this game is mechanically very good. Uh, but to me, they would be less valuable than this one. But I don't mind having fun, uh, not thinking about history 24-7. I do appreciate the opportunity of learning about history in a psychologically exciting and in, in, in and captivating way as historical games, as historical games do. I just know more about this topic now after playing the game than I did before. Sure, I could pick up a book, and, and I, I mean, I read one book about the history of this period, which is the, the, the book by Nathaniel Philbrick about Little Big Horn, but again, there's so many things I like to read about. I, that one book ain't much, now I know a little bit more. From the point of view of the game itself, again, is mechanically very solid because you have four factions and the objectives and the geography and what they can do creates a really interesting tension. Uh, everybody can be strong somewhere, no one can be strong everywhere. Uh, and everybody can be stronger if they make friends. So those are the guiding principles and they're usually solid principles in game design anyways. And so you know that that, that they work here because uh, the, the cavalry is incredibly powerful, but they cannot be everywhere. And the point is that they're trying to spread their agency as much as possible. They're trying to uh, protect the settlers because the fire power of the cavalry is so is so strong. The settlers, uh, they can spread out uh, easily, but again, they can also then be destroyed if they stretch too far. If they go ahead of the cavalry too much, sometimes you may have to do that. You risk it a little bit. And sometimes the settlers get lucky and their firepower indeed uh, gives them a powerful defense. The game has an arc, the game has a narrative, because later on, if the railroad is built, or mainly built, then um, settlers and cavalry can move a lot faster and threaten the center of the board a lot faster. I would say one major random element, uh, probably the biggest random uh, swing in the game, is uh, how long it takes to build the rocky uh, leg of the, of the railroad, because that is based on dice. There, there, there's a card that helps you with that, but ultimately you also need to roll. Uh, and if you draw that card early and you roll well, you're gonna build it early on, and it's very powerful that you can threaten uh, the, the the tribes on two sides, uh, um, or you don't, and then you threaten one side, and then the tribes can form more of a wall. But then the synergy comes from the fact that you that the cavalry can threaten their can threaten their flanks using the enemy, their own enemy allies, the enemy, the indigenous enemies. And as for the tribes, uh, again, their job is to resist, to push back, to delay, uh, and you really get that almost insurgent, counterinsurgency situation because uh, you have a massive firepower of the cavalry, and the uh, native tribes cannot triumph if we just go head on unless unless uh, they amass large numbers, but if they do so, then of course they're concentrating, so losing control of other parts of the territory that the enemies can sneak in. So it very often it will be hit and run tactics to reduce the enemy cavalry and then get to the, to the settlers and then occasionally get to the wagons. So all sides have a lot of objectives that they have to, uh, to complete, basically, or a lot of things that they have to think about. Limited resources, limited time, that like delightful scarcity that makes game designs exciting because it results in, in um, interesting decisions. So it's a solid design from the point of view of simply the mechanics and the objectives and the priorities. The game system, card driven and custom dice driven is one that I liked from, uh, from before, from when Academy made it popular and again I haven't seen games in that line in a while so I was very happy to play a game in that system now and the system is implemented very well here all the advantages that you may have liked in those games are gonna be here again with the uh, hand management uh, with uh, I know what the deck has so I can make some informed decisions but there's still a limit of randomness so the balance between agency and randomness both in the cards and with the dice is handled very well here and makes for very compelling gameplay. So I always gonna need four players, uh, that's ideal, um, but the game also comes with a number of solitaire options. Also the two sides are aligned enough that I think it would, I don't 
think you'll have any problem playing it, playing it um, two players, for example, or three players. So I think it looks pretty flexible that way. Me, I played it uh, with four players, and also I played it solitaire, but I played it four-handed. Um, if you watch my videos, that's something I do. Uh, you know, before the recent trend in AIs for solitaire play, I've been playing two-handed war games for a long time. That's very natural to me. And to me, that's easier than implementing an AI. And so I just played it four-handed that way, and I had a great time. Um, is, however, if you are interested in the solitaire option, it's nice that you have different ways in which you can automatize different parties, so you can play... Um, from different perspectives and the AI is very economic it gives you the effect I mean you don't have to draw a card and then look at the flow chart how they will uh, they would use that card there's simply a system that using dice that are not included but I think you have them at home using dice simply the non-active parties will uh, will add cubes to the board so the AI which is kind of AI that I like when I do engage with AIs is an AI that represents the effect of the enemy agency, not necessarily all the steps of their or their thinking. So, this being said, Plains Indian Wars is a really solid design. The production is gorgeous, as you saw. There is a lot of history in it. I learned a lot from this topic and just from the sheer point of view of game design. It has what I like in a game, which is a sophisticated, complex tree of decisions that I'm trying to navigate a nice balance between randomness and agency and a deep, sophisticated, complex engagement with history. So, high praise from me for Indians, uh, from Plains Indian Wars.